thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, don't don't worry about the. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Take your time, man. Um, we appreciate it. We're super. I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, so our podcast is all about your journey and music and how you got to where you are now. Okay, great. Um, and I don't know if you mind talking about um Godhead or if not at all. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind talking about any of my musical history. You know? Okay, cool. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't shy away from any of it. You know. Rad. Awesome. Because some people that, you know, want to stay away from old bands or whatever, but I know it's probably a big part of your, your journey. Um, so that's rad. If you, if you're willing to talk about it. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, why don't you just tell us first where, where you grew up and where you were raised? Um, well, I grew up in, um, rural Northern Virginia, which is kind of a, uh, an oxymoron, I guess, but, uh, (laughs) in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is really close to DC, uh, I grew up in the woods. I had some friends that would go to DC every weekend. I had other friends that wouldn't set foot in it. Um, <laughs> so I kind of got the I kind of got the best of both worlds. If I wanted to go see Fugazi, uh, I could. Wow. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, at the same time, uh, I definitely enjoyed living that kind of um, isolated, uh, you know, woods country lifestyle too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, how did you get into music? I always, I, um, early on, it's funny. I don't remember this happening, but my dad always tells the story. And that is that, um, uh, we were on a train. Uh, I think we we're like maybe going to visit my grandparents, uh, up North. And so we were on a train and we were in the, the, the entertainment car, I guess. And there was a guy playing covers, mm-hmm. you know, at, at, at the piano and uh he sort of jokingly uh i guess the the audience wasn't being that that participatory and so uh you know he was like well does anybody want to come up and sing and apparently i said well i want to sing so i got up and i sang country roads by uh by oh, John right. Denver. and apparently and this was me at like age four and oh. apparently the crowd went nuts so that got it in my head like to perform the, the first performance i do remember though is singing yesterday by the Beatles at age six at a school <laughs> assembly. And I just got the bug, man. That's just been my calling as a performer for the rest mm-hmm. of my life was yeah. probably from those two things and like seeing the crowd go crazy. Sure. What was, how'd you get into like, you know, the Beatles and, and John Denver and everything? Was well, that, those was are my first playing? records. My yeah. first records were Beatles records, John Denver, um, and it's and and it's funny because uh, my parents also gave me some Rolling Stones records, and I didn't like them as a kid. Oh, I think interesting! As a kid, you want to hear like major harmonies, and you want to hear like uh, just sort of like more pleasant things to sort of build your musical uh, your building blocks. Mm-hmm. I love the Rolling Stones now, but I didn't like them as a kid. It's really weird how those tastes change. Yeah, that is interesting. I could see that though. For you know, as a young child. The Beatles songs are definitely very uppity and very like the lyrics are easily digested by children and stuff. Whereas like Stones can get a little out there and right, they're a little more music. esoteric, and the kid's not going to be able to figure that out. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, singing obviously was the first real instrument you learned. Like aside from that, were you playing piano or guitar, anything as a as a young kid? Right. So I didn't really. I I I, I was uh, I. My very first instrument, oddly, was violin, um, hmm. although I was never that great at it. Um, <laughs> was it like a school band type? Right. Like, it was like choose your L- instrument L- at fifth grade band, or whatever. You know, yeah. Right. But I picked I, I didn't pick up the guitar till I was 14. But then okay. I just started going crazy from there. And I remember I even early on, I think I had piano lessons, hated it. Um, so it was just like singing then I discovered the guitar at 14 and never looked back. Were you doing clearly? Like vocal- <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Did you have vocal lessons or was that what you were doing yes, prior to I guitar? Had, I okay. had a lot. I had vocal lessons. Um, it, I think it was the kind of thing where, you know, someone said, hey, this, you know, he, he seems like he can really sing. Let's get him vocal lessons. And um, believe it or not, I took five years of classical uh, opera training wow oh wow yeah. and uh from high school into college and those techniques that i learned i still apply to how i sing today 
and they have really helped me on the road uh, to keep my voice healthy, uh, mm -hmm. to know when you're singing wrong and to know, like your body will tell you. Um, mm -hmm. But if I didn't have those years of opera training, that wouldn't have, I don't think that, that I would have those sort of inherent um, instincts mm -hmm. that, that that training uh, brought me. Yeah. And, and especially with, I mean, with opera, that's not only the, the range is crazy, but you're singing in a different language. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. for most of it, I would think. So, yeah. Wow. So you're doing that through high school and into college. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you singing in like you were playing guitar? Were you doing like, you know, garage band type things? Also, oh, yeah. All, or no? all, all the while, all the while garage band. Um, I played my first uh, club show with like a local band when I was 17. Um, and, and what was funny is that like when I was between the times that I was 17 and 21, um, you know, since the drinking age is 21 in Maryland and DC and Virginia, some clubs, if you were performing, they were okay with you being there. Mm -hmm. Other clubs where some of my band members were older, um, I would only be allowed to be inside the club while we were performing. And then I'd have oh, to go sure. out and sit in the parking lot <laughs> until either our next set or I would just have to leave immediately. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And it was <laughs> so it's basically like you could play. And then when you're done, they just kind of scoot you right outside in the back. Yeah, yeah. Did the rest of the band hang out with you or did they kind of stay inside and like, I think they, I think they stayed inside and tried to, you know, meet girls or whatever. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, it was, how did that band do? Did you guys eventually just break up? Like, um, I ended up leaving that band. And then, um, like the, 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 really the first band that I had any long-term success with was the band that eventually became Godhead. So okay. I, I started a band in college, um, uh, and we were originally called Blind, because the world's blind, you know, to our <laughs> oppression or whatever, whatever our theme was at the time. Uh, and um, uh, I remember I had a mohawk at the time, and we we I, we were playing at a there's there was this weird club in Virginia in Dumfries, Virginia, uh, called called Tiki Fala. And one half of it was a Chinese restaurant and the other half was a rock club. And That's every, everybody played it. But I remember one time I, you know, we, we were, we would take any show. So if a opening act canceled at the last minute, we wanted to be that band that the owner called, you know, so, and, but that helped us get headlining shows and just bigger things. Our, our first manager, um, who's still a lifelong friend of mine, Scott Cohen, who went on to form the Orchard and is wow. now like, he went on, he formed the Orchard and is now the um, the uh, CIO of Warner Brothers Music Worldwide. Jeez. He was our first <laughs> manager. And one, of, one a couple, couple things, a couple pieces of advice from him were, um, he was like, I don't care if you have a girlfriend or if you're married, like to your fans, you're single. You're single, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is funny because I think, and 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 if if you see that movie, that Tom Hanks movie, that thing you do, like there mm -hmm. was like a, there was an element of that in the movie too when they were giving the band advice. And then the other piece of advice was that always be ready to play, because uh, if if someone cancels, you want to be the band that they call in. And so we did that a lot. And mm -hmm. we did that specifically at Tiki Fala, a couple other couple other gigs too. But I remember on one of those gigs, uh, I said, you know, hello, we're blind. And then as soon as I as, as soon as I said that, the first thing that came back is your hair your hairdresser's blind. <laughs> so <laughs> that a mohawk. So oh, you know, got they, didn't it. Like that. they didn't like that. Sorry, it took me a long ways to get. No, to no, no. That, I love that story. <laughs> that's what I, that's what this is about. It's all about you and, and your journey. That's amazing. Uh, well, how did you meet that manager? Was that was he managing that band, or did he eventually manage God? He was managing? No, he. Well, he. Yeah, he was managing a band called Havoc, not the Havoc that's out now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and I guess we impressed him and he became our first manager and, you know, uh, really gave us a ton of advice 
Godhead eventually morphed or blind eventually morphed into Godhead. And, uh, you know, that was our, our first break was we actually got signed to a label out of Europe. And hmm. so we toured over in Europe for a couple of years. Then we toured, uh, in the States quite a bit. We were touring in the States. It was back, it was in the nineties where you could mm -hmm. kind of tour as an unsigned act. If you, if you knew how to do it and if you knew who to contact and if you knew how to line it up, right. Um, and so, uh, the, the, then we, uh, attracted the attention of bigger managers and, and, and bigger people. And eventually, um, Marilyn Manson's mm -hmm. team just dis <laughs> discovered us, you know, and, and so we, were, we were, yeah. And, uh, Marilyn Manson's manager came to see us play when we were playing in LA and we signed with hit with their record label. And we were the only band that he ever signed, but that right. really, you know, that changed our life that, you know, all of a sudden we're on the Ozfest. We're opening for Romstein. Of course oh, we, we, we opened for Marilyn Manson, like for a year and a half. Uh, you know, uh, and that really, I mean, you know, I have played in front of, you know, from the back of the train to looking out <laughs> and not being able to see the end of the people. That like, is how crazy is that? Oh my you know, gosh. and even if you're the opening act, that is still something that lives with you for the rest of your life. Oh, I can't even, I can't even imagine the feeling of walking out on a stage and looking out to x thousands upon thousands of people yeah that's probably a feeling you can you never you couldn't even explain i'm sure right <laughs> well i want to rewind sorry go ahead oh it's because and you got to keep it together man you know what i mean you got to like uh all right this you know you can't you can't lose it at that moment you know, right right yeah now you have the attention of all these people you gotta you gotta hit it out of the park uh but i want to rewind here uh just a little bit but to go back with so you've the formation you formed uh god's head and then tell me about like how that started like you obviously got signed to a european label but before that like what were those early days like yeah it was like you know really so it was blind um and it was our early days in our drummer's basement you know mm -hmm. and just trying to get gigs and regionally touring and getting um you know there was a thing where you could get a gig if you played it, you could present yourself as a cover band but then sneak in as many originals as you could right okay. so we were told you know if we're told like oh you have to play 70 percent covers then we would play like 50 percent covers and if we were told <laughs> you have you have to play 50 percent covers then we would play like 25 percent covers uh be, you know just to you know get you know if you, if you believe in your own material mm -hmm. you know uh that's what we had to do and uh yeah it was a really interesting time i mean i don't, it, it i so i moved to the los angeles area like 19 years ago now and um you know when after we were signed to manson's label and the way performing getting gigs the way that all of that's changed what mm -hmm. we did back then i don't think could be repeated Mm -hmm. uh, anymore but it, it you know there's a new uh, there's always a new way of people to break through back sure. then it was just touring your ass off and playing in front of as many people as possible right right um wow okay so well how did you guys change your name or like what 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 was the name change from the name change was when we signed with this european label um there was a band in Germany or something with the name blind. Oh, so had gotcha. to change it. And Godhead was a name that I always wanted to name a band. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I just thought it was a great name for a band and, and really cool. And uh, you know, the meaning of it is like the closest thing next to God. And I remember our first drummer at the time was like, well, people are going to think we're a Christian band. I'm like, I don't know. I don't think they're going to, but then what went, then we had a new drummer. So it was time to change the name. I'm like, we're going to call it Godhead. Let's do yeah. it. You know? Well, to me, it sounds like a metal band. Like right when I read it, I'm like, yeah, it's a metal band. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's cool. Um, so that was the change. And then that, do you know how the, the European label found you guys? Were you just touring? 
we don't you know that was through, or yeah or it was just demos. like making making attention gi- giving ourselves that you know uh i think it was our manager that probably found out about this and told them about us mm-hmm. but um you know yeah it was just just being active being active as a, as a band mm-hmm. and with that like how like how does manson's team hear you guys do you know how that all started and like how that conversation began well yeah it's kind of crazy i mean according to manson he actually so metal edge magazine did a small feature on on unsigned acts mm-hmm. and uh manson read about us in that oh uh, wow it's crazy and so the the then editor of metal edge magazine back then in like 1999 paul gargano is actually my manager now he manages the bands now oh wow and so we've been <laughs> we've been friends like pretty much my whole career mm-hmm. so oh so he he read about you in this magazine that's that's crazy yeah yeah and then got some demo material and we were making a lot of noise at the time because our our manager sean barouche at the time was able to uh to angle us onto some great tours. So like we were opening for Guar, then we were opening <laughs> for the Jenna Tortures, we were opening for Christian Death, like all bands that were like, we didn't quite fit with, but we fit with them enough. Mm-hmm. You know, like when we opened for Guar, uh, that was really trial by fire because <laughs> Guar fans don't care about anyone but, but Guar. <laughs> and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, rite of passage or just like some some guar fans go specifically to heckle the opening band you know (laughs) so we got hit with so many pennies and quarters and dimes really there's like change yeah we would always make like you know a couple of dollars every show just from picking up change after they threw it at us oh my so you're on like a tour with with guar you're on a tour with them yeah yeah Oh my God. How are the guys in Guar outside of the super nice, outfits? like the nicest guys ever? <laughs> like, you know, share the dressing room with us and, you know, come party with us afterwards. And, you know, like the, the sweetest guys. And so they, they saw what was happening too, you know, and they felt bad, but, um, but they, uh, you know, that apparently, you know, like one of tools first, uh, tours was opening for Guar, so I think we were just telling to ourselves like, "Well, Tool can do this. We can do <laughs> right, this. exactly, you know? exactly." That's cool. I did see. Like, have you? Do you are you familiar with Cameo? That app yeah. mm-hmm. that you, you know you can do the videos or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the drummer. One of the members of Guar has one, and it's pretty awesome. If you look at his, because he's in the full thing, and right. he's just like being so mean about whoever he's talking about yeah <laughs> it's yeah it's really Birthday, good who cares <laughs> right exactly that's kind of what it is and he just goes i don't care and he goes on these spiels but yeah it's it's pretty funny <laughs> but that's good that they're nice outside of the costume they're shtick so very cool um okay so you guys signed a manson's label tell me about that moment. i mean that must have been just so crazy yeah it was surreal i mean look he's a genius right like mm-hmm. like and um, the character of Marilyn Manson that he created is, you know, a iconic figure that will live in music history forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and we worked really closely with him for two years. It was it was a great experience. Um, it was also a confusing experience, um, and you know, it it ended rather poorly, I would say, but other other than that like i'll always be super super grateful to him and their whole team for you know uh, legitimizing us which in turn legitimized me and gave me a career for the rest of my life so right yeah well so how how many albums did you guys put out with with uh, just the one just one oh wow yeah. just that first the 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 nothing list nothing no 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 so nothingness was on soul three records which which ended up becoming the orchard and and power tool stigmata was also on the orchard then um when orchard was in its early days 
then oh. uh then 2000 years of human error was on manson's label post human okay three albums after that we had mm -hmm. um which were on and that's kind of the how things with god had really started to slow down because we had three albums after that that were all on kind of startup labels okay. and so you know i'll always tell this to new musicians your behind the scenes team is so incredibly important. No one sees that as a fan. As a fan, you know, they'll be like, how come your stuff isn't played on the radio? And it's like, listen, there's like so many factors beyond <laughs> sure. why, why anything gets on the radio. It's not you know, because I don't want it on the radio. Right, yeah. I mean? <laughs> uh, although that might be a good angle, angle to take. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't want my stuff on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but your behind the scenes team is so incredibly important. And when you have to restart it each time, like, so we as a band felt like we were making an incredible amount of artistic progress. So mm -hmm. every album that we did in our minds got better and right. better artistically, but it did worse and worse economically because we uh, not only was the industry changing at the time and sort of we were in that switching formats thing to where people right. were buying cds and then napster came out and then uh you know apple music came out and then it, it was just like in this weird period where people were getting music in a lot of different ways and when our record label team would change each time you know it's just like you got to put more grease in the wheel and you got to, mm -hmm. you got to like add this cog. And when you keep changing parts, it, the, the car is not going to run as efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what happened. And um, so we, we have never officially broken up. Mm -hmm. um, and, but uh, you, you know, and there's always a chance that we'll do something together again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that we, we're getting more and more demoralized, not even with each other, but just with the state of the industry of how much, you know, the labels that we were on after Manson mm -hmm. sort of kept having these hiccups and kept, you know, uh, promising us the world and then nothing would happen or, uh, you know, uh, the, the next single is gonna launch, but the, the radio promotions guy is, out on vacation for two weeks in that window that your single is going to launch like all those like stupid right. things like, <laughs> kept happening it was like it was just bad luck after bad luck after bad luck and so it it demoralized us as a as a band to be like well why are we making all this material if nobody's going to hear it mm -hmm. you know um and so going back to growing up in the woods and you know listening to country music and and um i i just really wanted to do something completely different godhead was you know uh we ran uh, electronic tracks and and there's such a big machine to make us move to make us go i wanted to do something a full 180 of that something that was inspiring to me um someone said the best you know a song's good if the singer can just sing it with with them and an acoustic guitar mm -hmm. right you're so right that's what sort of broke down to what i wanted to do solo wise and um that's where all of my solo material sort of stems from that of i want mm -hmm. to be as basic as possible and if the song's good i'll put it out in its most basic form. And then I started building it back up, but in another direction, you know? Sure, sure. And so that's kind of what started the solo career. It's just that, just kind of wanting to get away from the, uh, like just what was happening with, with the band. And the yeah, like I didn't want to, and, and what and I didn't the... want to do is this, I didn't want to put out a solo record that sounded just like Godhead. And I didn't want to sure. put together a new band that sounded just like Godhead. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people do that. You know, they'll be like, this is my new band. It sounds just like my old band. Here we go. You know, <laughs> right. and, and I didn't want to be that that person. Sure. Uh, was it difficult? Like, tell me about doing your first, like, so you write your first, your, like doing so shows as a solo artist. Was that 
different yeah, for people I mean, was, or coming from that to where people like shocked by the sound like sonically how it cha- like sonically changed like so there were a lot of curious people mm-hmm. in the audience now mike uh our guitar player from godhead mike and i had done some solo acoustic shows where it's just him and i and and uh you know, just the two of us doing acoustic shows. So I, I had a little bit of experience of that, but really a lot of, it was like starting over and there were a lot of curious ears at, at the first few shows for sure. Just to be like, well, what's he doing? Mm-hmm. You know, um, because I think that country as a whole has a real stigma to anybody that's not in country. And I don't know what they were expecting my music to sound like, but I think they were, not expecting it to sound like what I put out because whatever I do, I am always going to own it. You know, like every Godhead record, that was me. I, I own that, like that, I, that is a part of me. Mm -hmm. And any solo record that I put out is always going to be authentically me. Um, And even on the last album, you know, when, there are certain songs that, you know, with a couple of different instrument changes could sound like Godhead songs. Mm-hmm. And even, I don't know if you saw the video for Get Me Behind Me, but I mean, that could be a Godhead video. In mm-hmm. half the video, I'm dressed up like the devil. Right. You know, in, the, you know, <laughs> in the middle of this crazy apocalyptic desert. And I'm so proud of that because I'm never going to put something out with my name on it that isn't authentically me. Mm-hmm. I'm never mm-hmm. gonna try to be anything that I'm not. So sure. And you put out your first solo record like 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, was it we like was that like kind of during a period where Godhead wasn't going as hard? Because I right. I did see that you you I mean you guys have put out a record in 2014 with Godhead. So right. So the, the 14 record was a remix record. Oh that we sure. Had been sitting on. Um. But so really, our last record, our last like pure record was 2008. Oh, okay, so then you just kind of from there did started the solo project. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry, one sec. We have a okay. This guy's fixing my washing machine downstairs. So if you hear like that whack whack, like okay. I was trying, I was trying to wait for him to stop. We have an editor; he'll cut that part out. So sorry. Okay. Um. Uh. Yeah. So okay. Uh. Now I lost my train of thought. Um. Oh yeah, solo project. Okay, so you start you start your solo thing. Um. Like, tell me about your, did you tour with it right away? And how was that? Were you just not right away? I, I not right away, but then, um, my next album on country, I definitely toured on that. And I'll always throw a couple Godhead songs into my set, you know, for the people that might be there that were fans of that as well. Um, mm-hmm. because I, I fully understand that people still want to hear that. And, uh, but yeah, no, I, I started touring on it. I really, you know, the idea was to tour on it pretty quickly. And uh, that, and that's what I did. And um, I think that as performers, you know, we always have a, it, 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 we do it because we love it and because we have a calling to do it. And um, I didn't mind the fact that I was playing in smaller venues or, or anything like that because, um, you know, I always will believe in myself and will, I just, I perform for the joy of performing. If there's 10 people there, or if there's 10,000 people there, I'm, I'm putting my all in the performance, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, with, uh, with that though, like, like, were you, have you been touring, were you touring like all the way up until COVID hit? I was, in fact, um, I, man, I was booked on so many awesome festivals this year. (laughs) Um, I had two European tours planned, a U.S. tour planned. I was on um, one week, okay, this is, this is, and and you've listened to a little bit of my music, so you probably uh, would know this Mm -hmm. about me, that how how perfect this is. (laughs) One weekend, I was booked on the Merle Haggard Boxcar Festival. Oh, wow. The very next weekend, I was booked on the Ronnie James Dio Memorial Festival. Oh, so wow. With the same act, you know, as, as it does Green work Park. though. 
It yeah, does work yeah. though. <laughs> um, I was also I was also booked on the awesome Muddy Roots Festival that I played last year. But luckily, it seems as though all of these festivals have they've kind of taken whoever was going to be on it in 2020. They've just moved it to 2021. So that's awesome. Um, that's that, that, fingers that's crossed cool. that that all happens. I think the earliest one is in May. So fingers crossed that by May there'll at least be some outdoor festivals again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll see. I, I did see that you do like a Music Monday Twitch stream. Is how, how, tell me about that. How, do you enjoy that? Or is, I love it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I've been involved with Twitch since the early days, but more on like the nerdy side of my life. The video so games, right? I, video games and and also uh, tabletop role playing games. So I used to host a show um, on a channel called Geek and Sundry. Uh, called starter kit where we teach people how to play role-playing games and, oh that's rad and that aired on on twitch so so when covid hit uh i was like you know i'm just going to do miller's music mondays live and really start to build this show up so mm-hmm. every monday like since june uh you can find me on my twitch channel and a couple of weeks ago we were featured on the front page you know that's huge really really great um so every week i have a different guest so to keep it fresh uh because let's face it even if i played like every piece of material that i know or every cover that i know or whatever (laughs) it's going to get boring for people well every week i have a new guest and uh and they're usually just my friends i'm so thankful and grateful that i have so many talented friends i was gonna say you probably have friends that are (laughs) superstars uh so uh it, it's you know the more the more friends that uh that come on the you know yeah it's getting bigger and bigger so i'm wait i'm waiting uh to uh, now that i have a good relationship with with the the, the people at twitch i can e- start even bringing on the bigger the bigger guests you know mm-hmm. who, uh, who have you had on so far if you, if you don't mind me asking um yeah i mean uh, i'm trying to think so my friend hallelujah who was a um american idol idol wow. fi- final finalist um, I had, um, Ellis Hall who sang for, um, Tower of Power and was okay. the, one of the original singing California Raisins. And like, he's really? been on everything. Like, oh he, my he, like this amazing soul singer. Uh, the, when we got featured on the front page, it was for my friend, Julia Cole, who's an independent country singer, but she has over like a million listeners a month on Spotify, which oh my is my gosh, funny. that's um, crazy. And like next week I have um, the band eight millimeter. Who, oh, I love them. Yeah. Sean, Sean Bevins, like a uh-huh. Grammy award uh, nominated producer. And, and Julian or Julia is why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. We yeah, interviewed was- the, actually we uh, I've interviewed them before for this podcast. They're um, awesome. I love they're them. so cool. We got a chance to go to their house. We did the interview at their house. Uh, oh, cool. In Sean's studio downstairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. It was really cool. He actually yeah. mixed, uh, he, he mixed and produced um, one of my friend's records. Uh, he's in a band called Unwritten Law, and he wrote the theme song for our uh, for our show. And oh, yeah, great. and he he produced their record. Yeah, great, great uh, pair of, of, of humans. <laughs> Love them. <laughs> yeah, me too. We all went to go see. I I, I texted him a couple of days ago because I was like, it's a one year anniversary. So we're all such nerds. Like so, so many musicians are also nerds. We went to a screening of all three extended edition Lord of the Rings films in a row. <laughs> That's oh so my God. At the Egyptian theater last year, you get there at noon and we were there till two in the morning. <laughs> I just play all three. And you've got to, ch- you've got to, you've got to break in. You got a half hour break in between each one, like go get something to eat. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. <laughs> Wow, was everybody like there dressed up in their a lot their were. gear? I mean, we weren't, and... but yeah, a lot. Of, there were a lot of cosplayers there for sure. Love it. That's cool. Well, you're involved quite a bit with like video game voiceover and stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the one. The 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 silver lining for the tours being canceled is that I'm here, and so my uh, my voiceover career this year has like gone gangbusters like never before. That's amazing. Um, I even had the opportunity. There's a couple of huge games that I'm in that I'm, of course, not allowed to talk about yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I mean, I was even cast as the voice of Optimus Prime in a game. Um, wow. 
the uh, there's a game called World of Warships, and they did a Transformers crossover thing, and I got cast as Optimus Prime, which is like kind of a dream come true. But uh, you know, uh, I got to sing on a cartoon, um, a couple episodes of the cartoon DC Superhero Girls on the Cartoon Network. Wow! Um, I've sung the theme song, the the, the last, the 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 most two, two most recent theme songs to final fantasy 14. Um, you know, there's, there's been a ton of stuff that I've worked on this year and that at least kind of makes up for the fact that I'm not, uh, not on all these tours, but you know, it, it, I, I, I'm thankful that I'm diverse enough in my, under the enter, under my bubble of the entertainment biz, right. You know, that I have these different things that I can do. That's cool. How did you get involved with the uh, with the voiceover from being a musician to the, the voiceover? Well, I Godhead was writing in between tours. Godhead would sometimes we'd submit for commercials and things like that. And we actually oh, sure. booked one uh, for Pop-Tarts. We actually wrote a <laughs> Pop-Tarts commercial like no one would know it was Godhead at all. <laughs> That's so awesome. Uh, the, I remember the direction was like write something like the end of Pearl Jam's Alive. And we're like, well, we can do that. So, so <laughs> we did that. And at one point they needed a voice. They just wanted a voice to go like, oh yeah, on it. <laughs> and uh, because that it was a national commercial that made it, I could, I was eligible to join the Screen Actors Guild. And so that oh, gave sure. me a spark. I was like, you know, um, from doing community theater and 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 school theater, I was like, I'm going to give this a try. So I mm-hmm. I took classes, um, I pursued an agent, I met different people in the industry, and I just really uh, made it one of my pursuits. And I've been doing it pretty steadily for like 17 years now. It's That's amazing. Career. Yeah, I looked at your like discography, so to speak, of of all the games and stuff that yeah, you've done. Yeah, if you look at my so IMDb, cool. it's like I have 120 entries on the acting side. Yeah, it's like, crazy. I have more, more, more acting stuff than music stuff on there. So <laughs> very cool. Well, thank you so much for for doing this, Jason. I really, really appreciate your time, man. Yeah, it's been awesome. Um, um, but I, I want to do talk about your new. You have a new record out, right? Yeah, well, I have a new single out, and I have a, and the album is coming out um, February nineteenth. Oh, yes, tell so, me about the the new record. So the single is called "Better Late Than Never," and I wrote that a few years ago with Jonathan Tyler, who's uh, an awesome uh, solo artist, and he's also in Nikki Lane's band. And um, that is the first song that you'll hear from the album. The album's going to be called. I'm actually putting out two mini albums next year so two although i feel like i'm i keep adding songs so there might be two full <laughs> albums i don't know but i did see right there's now, a part one and a part two right the part or... one there's a part two so it's from it's called from the wreckage uh right now i have seven songs each slated uh but it might turn into eight songs each i'm not sure uh, but right now slated seven songs each it's called from the wreckage and the idea behind it is i have all these songs that i really believe in that maybe um, they either didn't fit with the um, theme of my last album or my album before that, or a record company guy didn't like it or something. Well, so, you know, with, with, I launched my own record label for my own music and I'm gonna put out whatever I want. (laughs) So so (laughs) I'm taking these songs that I really believed in, some of them are fully recorded and ready to go. Others I'm re-recording or, or adding a few things to it. And I'm putting out the songs that I want to put out. Mm-hmm. And so that's what From the Wreckage is. Um, the wreckage being either the wreckage of old songs or old, or old albums or the wreckage that we're in right now that we're experiencing every day. So that's sort of what the theme is on that. I love that. And you have a studio, right? You, you yes. have your own studio? Fact, that's why I was late because uh, what, the weirdest thing happened on one of our studio computers, uh, like four keys on a keyboard stopped working. And I don't mean like a, a musical keyboard. I mean like, you know, like, like this, 
kind of keyboard. Oh yeah, like your actual yeah. keyboard. Yeah, uh, on, on, you know, and and so I had to rush over there and bring like a spare keyboard so that we could the session could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, no worries. Yeah. But is that do you get to is is that where you're recording your 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 records? I, obviously, okay. I record I record almost everything there. Um, uh, some of the songs were produced by Matt Hyde, and we did a lot of that at his studio. And the only thing that I don't record at my studio right now are drums, because uh, the drum room I've actually rented out long term to uh, the to uh, television composers. But that's another story. So when I do drums, I rent somewhere else. Okay. Uh, or I go to Kenny Aronoff, who has his own uh, drum studio, and Kenny Aronoff is like a, a legend in drumming, and I'm so glad that I know him and have a relationship with him that I can, mm -hmm. you know, get him to be on my records. Uh, and yeah, so having your own studio definitely gives me a lot more flexibility to kind of record when I want and Unless of course it's being rented by the hour by a, a client or something, then I got to go in at night. But that's okay. <laughs> yeah. it, you just you have the access though, which is right, great, and right. you you it, spend all the time you want in there and uh, not spend a ton of money on you know per hour studio time and right. and all that. Does it, do you think that it gets with with that like having that much time? Do you feel like it can get to a point where you're just like over adding to a song or when you write something, you're like, okay, yes. this is going to be it. You got to be careful not to overproduce anything, mm -hmm. you know, cause then it just sounds too, uh, homogenized, you know? So right. I always try to make, just capture that live energy as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, Jason, again, thank you so much for, for doing this. Really, really appreciate it. Yes. Um, I do have one more question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Yes, uh, make sure, someone told me this early on and it, and it really, uh, it really struck with me. And that is make sure that your worst performance is better than anybody else's best performance. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, hone your craft and uh you know do that time like don't take any shortcuts because people will know and and so just rehearse and practice and really um hone it so that so that you're the absolute so that you're so good that nobody can ignore you Bring it back for you.